Good morning. We greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We welcome you to the Lord's house as we begin the Lord's Day together. Several things you need to be aware of that are happening this week. Men, today is your last day to sign up for the Ridge Haven work trip that will be happening later in the week. If you haven't yet done that, there's a sign up in the narthex or you can speak to Pastor Dodds. Ladies, I would just remind you that Taco Tuesday Fellowship Night is on for you for this week. The sign up is done and it's filled. But if you signed up, ladies, that is this week. Need to let you know what's happening with our Bible school. Vacation Bible School is sort of an all-hands-on-deck, delightful time for us each summer. And we need you to sign up to volunteer for this. Even if you can only be there for part of the week, we can use you. From nursery workers to class assistants and craft volunteers, we need your help. And there are also opportunities to help with craft preparations and decorating the church in the weeks leading up. Children who are going to attend Vacation Bible School... You, moms and dads, you need to register your children if you've not already done so. The deadline for registration is May 23, and space is limited. Registration is open for all Woodruff Road members and visitors and their family members who might not be attending Woodruff Road. And so whether you're registering as a volunteer, that is 8th grade to 99 years old, or registering as an attendee, rising 1st graders through rising 7th graders, um, you can sign up today in the Narthex or online through our website. Rising 6th and 7th graders this year, there will be a special program for you with Pastor Anderson. I want to remind you that this week we have several prayer meetings happening. You can find those times and dates in your bulletin. We would encourage you to pick one of those and plug into it. And this Wednesday, speaking of prayer meeting, that begins with our dinner at 545, followed by catechids for preschool and elementary age youth group for middle school and high school, and adult prayer meetings. And we would also point out, if you look in your bulletin, I think it's over on the far right, if you open your bulletin up where it's the huge flap style, um, we have, we'll be having our 4 p.m. social distancing service for three more Sundays, today and two more weeks. And May 9th will be the final one of those services. So if you've been attending the social distancing service, that will go away. I think it'll be about 55 weeks that we will have done that. Would we'll also invite you to immediately following this service to join us for refreshments in the fellowship hall, then our excellent Sunday school classes. If you're visiting with us, that room right back there that's the glass tin room, I'll be teaching the intro to Woodruff Road class. That's for visitors or people who are still trying to figure out what we're all about. I'll be teaching that class, subbing for Pastor Dodds, and so the quality of teaching will go way down today. But I'll be teaching on covenant theology and our commitment to it. And then the Lord's Day closes out tonight at 6 p.m. as we continue in our series on the life of Samuel. Today in worship, you're going to do many things. That's why we use the word liturgy, because liturgy means the work of the people. You'll sit and stand, sing and pray, read and listen, give an amen, and carefully examine your copy of God's Word. And I want to urge you to participate with your whole body, your whole voice, and especially your whole mind, and to think carefully about what you're saying when you're confessing, singing, hearing. Consider, weigh, and reflect. There's never time in biblical worship when you can sit back and drift away. God never invites people into his presence to be passive, disinterested observers, but only active participants. As you worship, gird up your mind and purpose to worship the living God in spirit and in truth. Shout, shout. 
Hear the word of the Lord now as we're called into worship by Psalm 5. Let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those also who love your name be joyful in you. For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor, you will surround him as a shield. Let's take our Trinity Psalter hymnals and turn to hymn 380 as we stand and sing, Crown Him with Many Crowns. When we come confessing our sins corporately, we do so in hope, the hope of the gospel, the hope of hearing the word of pardon and the good news of the forgiveness of sins. Almighty God, you are rich in mercy to all who humbly call upon you. We have broken your laws by our words and deeds and the sinful affections of our hearts. Have mercy upon us, O Lord. Now hear the gospel, the good news of forgiveness of sins that comes only through faith in Christ from Micah 7. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. He will again have compassion on us and will subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea.
Please take your copy of God's Word or the Pew Bible in the rack in front of you and turn to Isaiah 54 for our Old Testament reading. You will notice that our Old Testament reading is filled with promises. And this is fitting because our New Testament text, the words of the Lord Jesus, are as well. We'll be talking a lot about promise to, promises today, but notice what some of these glorious promises are in Isaiah 54, the first 10 verses. Listen carefully because this is God's holy, inerrant, and authoritative word. Sing, O barren, you who have not borne, break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not labored with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare, lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you shall expand to the right and to the left, and your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. Do not fear, for you will not be ashamed. Neither be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame. For you will forget the shame of your youth and will not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. For the Lord has called you. Like a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, like a youthful wife when you were refused, says your God. For a mere moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercies I will gather you. With a little wrath I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness I will have mercy on you, says the Lord your Redeemer. For this is like the waters of Noah to me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be angry with you nor rebuke you. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has mercy on you. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, freely you have received, freely give. Believer, can you name anything you own that was not given to you by God? Even your ability to work and accumulate wealth is a gift from an all-merciful sovereign. Wise and mature believers understand that everything we have is only entrusted to us as a very temporary stewardship for which we'll give account on the last day. When you understand that you're not the owner of these funds, just the caretaker, it takes the struggle out of giving generously. Remember, the one who entrusted you with these resources is the same one who commands you to worship him with the tithe. And so let us give as those who have freely received. Let's pray. Our Father, all our resources come to us because you've opened the windows of heaven and poured them out into our hands. Who are we then to be stingy and tight-fisted since we've only received? Give us generous hearts as we give and give us joyful hearts as we contemplate how you will use these funds to build your church around the globe. We pray in the name of Jesus, our only Savior. Amen.
Let's pray. Almighty, sovereign Lord, you are the creator and ruler over all. Your name endures forever. You are a God of light, and in you is no darkness at all. And from you proceedeth every good and perfect gift. The heavens declare your glory, O God, and the firmament showeth your handiwork. Therefore we come to you believing that you are the powerful and bountiful rewarder of those who diligently seek you. All your perfections are matchless and without comparison. You are our eternal, immortal, and invisible king. You are the giver and taker of life. You have no beginning and you have no ending, and you change it not. You search our hearts and understand our thoughts. There is not one word on our tongue that you do not know. Your understanding is infinite. How unsearchable is your wisdom, your knowledge, and your judgments. Your dominion is an everlasting dominion, and your kingdom is from generation to generation. You do according to your will in heaven and on the earth, and nobody or anything can thwart your plans. We know that all power belongs to you, and with you nothing is impossible. As we've already confessed, we're all sinners and deserving of death and eternal separation from you. We're not worthy to be called your children, but you have assured us that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We thank you for your tender mercies, which are new every day. We thank you for your provisions that meet our daily needs and for your loving kindness to us. Lord, you formed us for yourself that we might show forth your praise. We bless you that when the fullness of time was come, you sent forth your son, made of a woman, made under the law, so that we could become your adopted children. We thank you that the Son of Man is come, that we might have life, and that we might have it more abundantly. We are thankful also, Father, for the assurance we have of eternal life. We pray for grace to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, to set our love upon you and to delight ourselves in you. We beseech you to give us the full awareness of your mercies, that our hearts might be genuinely thankful, and that we show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives. By giving of ourselves to your service and by walking before you, in holiness and righteousness all our days. Father, we bring our petitions before you with boldness and confidence and claim all the promises of your covenant, for you are a covenant-keeping God to a thousand generations. You tell us that not even a sparrow falls to the ground without your knowledge, and yet how much more valuable are we than they? Father, you know the needs of each of your children. So we pray that you would minister to each, to each one according to your perfect will. May we all find joy and contentment in serving and even in suffering for your name's sake. We pray for the successful spread of the gospel all around the world. May it go forth with power and conviction, and may it destroy all the enemies that attempt to defeat it. We pray for our country and all our elected officials. May they fear you and pursue truth and righteousness and be controlled by your Holy Spirit. Now, Father, as we lift up your servant as he proclaims the truth of the Holy Scriptures, may Jesus Christ be proclaimed boldly and clearly. Give us ears to hear and hearts to respond, and may our lives be transformed into the likeness of Christ. We offer this prayer. In the name of your Son and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.
Please take your Bibles once again and turn to John's Gospel, chapter 14, for our New Testament reading. Let's stand as we reverence the Word of God. John 14, reading verses 19 through 24. This, too, is the holy and inerrant Word of God. Pay careful attention. A little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. At that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. This is the word of the Lord. Let's prepare for the preaching of the word by taking our Trinity Psalter hymnals and turning to 378. Look ye saints, the sight is glorious. Hymn 378. Our God is a a promiser by nature, and it's his nature not only to make promises, but to keep them. His promises are not like ours. We make promises, but die and can't fulfill them, or we change our minds, or lose passion, or commitment, and don't keep our promises. That can be vows at baptism, marriage, church membership. You can't read scripture very long without seeing that. But think of some of the promises our God made. He promised that one of Eve's offsprings would crush the serpent in Genesis 3, and he did. He promised Noah that he would never again destroy the world by a flood in Genesis 9, and he hasn't. He promised Abraham that he would give him innumerable descendants in Genesis 12, and he has. He promised in Exodus 6 to deliver the Israelite nation from Egyptian slavery, and he did. He promised in Joshua 1 to give Joshua and the Israelites victory over the Canaanites, and he did. 
He promised in 2 Samuel 7 to give an everlasting throne to David's greater descendant. And that's just a sample. The Bible is overflowing with promises that God has made. The Lord wants you to see and know his promises, meditate upon them, because he knows what strength spiritually they'll give you. God wants you to be confident and solid in what you believe about him in the future. He doesn't want you waffling through life. He wants you to be so familiar with his character that you can say, I know what God is going to do. I don't know when or how, but he's made me some promises. And I will walk by faith in those promises until I see the fulfillment of them. Today, we are going to see our Lord Jesus making several more promises, rich promises, but we'll need the help of the Holy Spirit to hear them rightly. Let's seek that now. Our Father, how we thank you for putting us into possession of your sacred, inerrant word. We know as we hold it in our hands now that it's the most precious gift we could possess, worth more than precious gold, imparting more wisdom than any Ph.D. But, O oh, gracious Lord, all the riches of your word will fall to the ground if you don't send the Holy Spirit to sovereignly, graciously open our eyes to understand it. So sweep away all of the things that could distract us, bind the evil one in his blinding power, Give us concentration and remembrance. Most of all, keep us from being armchair hearers only. Give us grace to be effectual doers of the word that we hear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hope you have your Bible open to John 14. If you've never been with us before, our practice on Lord's Days is in the mornings to preach through a New Testament book. And so we've been at this, uh, I don't know, 70 weeks maybe in the Gospel of John. And in the evenings, we've just begun our series on the life of Samuel. We certainly hope that you'll join us tonight at 6 p.m. and close out the Lord's Day in worship and the hearing of the word. But as you open your Bible to John 14 and you see our context, let me remind you of what's come before in John 13 and 14. It's Thursday night in Jerusalem. It's Passover week. As Jesus and his 12 disciples gathered to eat the Passover, they came upstairs to an upper room. Jesus disrobed, knelt before each disciple, washed their feet like a house servant. And then after that, when they reclined at the table to have Passover meal, Jesus issues a couple of prophecies, one that Judas would betray him that night. Judas quickly leaves. Jesus issues the new commandment, to love one another as I've loved you. And then Jesus prophesies again that Peter will deny him that night three times. Peter questions, disagrees. Jesus, seeing that the disciples are troubled, begins to try to comfort them by speaking of the home he'll prepare. Thomas answers and says, we don't know the way to this home. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Philip asks for Jesus to show them the Father. Jesus says, he who's seen me has seen the Father. And for the first time, we've already seen this, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. He equates love with obedience. And then Jesus promises another helper, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, whom the world won't be able to receive. And today you're going to hear Jesus in our context making four promises to his disciples. This should be familiar to us. As I already noted, scriptures are loaded with promises, well over 3,500 of them, loaded. Loaded with promises from a loving God to us. Remember what Peter writes in 2 Peter 1 when he says, we've been given exceedingly great and precious promises. Now, let me make a few distinctions. Let me distinguish promises from other sorts of divine communication. The Bible teaches us largely, this is broad brush, in three ways. By commandments, which teach us obedience. By threats, which restrain our disobedience. And by promises, which confirm our obedience. These promises have to be distinguished from commands and threats because the promises don't tell our duty or what will happen if we don't do our duty. They confirm what God will do in his sovereign mercy and by his good pleasure. And the promises as well are the grounds of our hope. They're the objects of our faith. They're the rule of our prayer. All of these promises, first of all, they're the grounds of our hope, 
We hope for what God has promised because we're unable to look for anything besides what he's already declared he'll bestow. If we hope for the things God has promised, our hope is solid. But without God's promises, we're hopeless. The promises of God are also the objects of our faith in that we can believe what God has promised because of the one who promised it. We may believe the promises of God because they're the promises of God, not a man. Remember what Numbers 23 says? God is not a man that he should lie. Anything believed without a promise is only presumption. But the promises of God are also the rule for our prayer. Just as we hope for and believe what God has promised, so we must pray for what God has promised. Let's begin to define what we mean by promise, because you're going to see four of them in our text. A promise is a truth that will benefit us in particular. A promise declares God's will concerning the good with which he'll bless us or the evil that he'll remove from us. It's an irreversible declaration he makes to believers. Another definition of promise. It's the goodwill of God towards sinners in which he engages to, to bestow some good upon them or withhold some evil from them. It's not what he hopes to do or will attempt to do, but what he has committed to accomplish for us. Now, let me give you a hermeneutical hint, an interpretive hint. If you're reading your Bible and you're wanting to know, am I reading promises? If you see either one of the following words, you can be pretty certain that it's a promise. Will or shall when applied to God. If you hear God say, I will do this, I shall do that, that's probably a promise. And what you will see in our text today is you will see a lot of wills and shalls. Now, let me remind you of some of God's promises because you're thinking, well, Carl, what has God promised me? Let me put you in the right frame of mind to receive these promises of Christ. There are general promises to believers, such as the one in Psalm 84, no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. There are promises to believers concerning their children. The faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him, God says in Deuteronomy 7. There are promises to widows that the Lord will destroy the house of the proud. The Lord says in Proverbs 15, but he will establish the boundary of the widow. There are those promises which we live by, we cling to every Sunday when we have the corporate confession of sin and then we hear the word of pardon. Why can we be so certain that God has forgiven us? Because he promised to do so. When God gave the promise of the new covenant, he said in Jeremiah 31, I will, there's that word will, forgive their sin and I will remember their sin no more. Of course, there's the promise of a redeemer. Given in Matthew chapter 1, when the angel says he shall save his people from their sins. There's the promise of heard and answered prayer. When Jesus says, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. There's the promise of wisdom. Do you feel foolish? Do you feel immature, lacking in the ability to know how to proceed in the Christian life, how to parent, how to have a marriage? James says in James 1, Listen for the will and shall work. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. And it will, that's a promise word, it will be given to him. Then there's the promise of a resurrection. When you stand by the graveside and you think, will I ever see this person again? My spouse, my parent, my friend. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Christ. There's the promise in days to come. Some of you come here today <clears throat> assaulted, tormented by chronic pain, pain in your body, pain in your mind. <clears throat> we are given repeated promises of deliverance from all pain and sorrow in heaven. Revelation 21, listen to the will words and the shall words. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There are the promise, 
Parents, as you guide your children into relationships, there are promises of blessing upon godly relationships and cursing upon ungodly ones. In Proverbs 13, the Lord says, He who walks with the wise will be wise, but the companion of fools, this is an equal promise, will be destroyed. For some of you today who come here and you're struggling with so much temptation, perhaps it's to lust or to lie or to steal or to covet, and you're saying, I, I just cannot resist. I must succumb every time. I always try to clarify when someone comes to me and says, Carl, I'm struggling with this temptation. And I'll say, are you struggling or just succumbing? And they'll usually say, I'm, I'm really just succumbing because I don't think that I can overcome this temptation. Listen to the promise of God of deliverance from temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God who is faithful will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation, here comes the other promise, will make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. In our text, look at it carefully in John 14, Jesus makes four rapid fire promises to the 11 remaining disciples in the room and to us. Look at those very carefully with me. These are huge promises, promises that stretch out into eternity, promises that define the Christian life. The first is Jesus promises in verse 19 that the believer will see Christ. He says, a little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Now notice he's going to see Christ, not the world. There's the antithesis again, uh, antithesis again, that great gulf fixed between the world and the church, those who love Jesus and those who don't. Now notice in verse 19, the unbeliever, his day of opportunity is now officially gone, Jesus says. Now, look at this brief little glimpse of the antithesis seen even in Jesus' language. Look at verse 22. Jesus clarifies that he's not referring to Judas Iscariot, who is of the world, but the other Judas. This is the only place in John's gospel where the other Judas is mentioned, and he's only referred to in the scriptures in Luke 6 and Acts 1, where we learn he's the brother of James. But John and the Holy Spirit don't want posterity to lump the good Judas in with the world. So notice what we're told in verse 22. Judas, not Iscariot. Because what Jesus is doing is he's making this sharp divide in verse 19. Here's who will see me in the future, the church, the believer. Here's who will not see me, the world. Now, this isn't academic or theoretical. It's experiential. This seeing of Jesus doesn't re refer to a visible ocular experience. It's what Paul speaks of in Philippians 3.10 when he says, He counts all things lost for the excellence of knowing Christ. He knows Jesus by the word and the Spirit's work. Don't expect in this life to see Jesus visibly so that you would hear him say, as he did to Thomas, put your hand into my side or see a vision. No, it's a, it's a revelation by the word and by the spirit to your soul. It's a vivid realization of Christ's presence and a deep and abiding knowledge of his love for you. You hear Christ preached and the Holy Spirit witnesses to that revelation within the heart of the believer. Now look carefully at verse 19 and look at the promise. Believing friend, Jesus promised that you'd see him. Is that your experience and your delight? You have had Jesus held before your eyes week after week from this pulpit. Have you seen him? Have you seen him as your only hope? Have you seen him as the one who fulfilled the law on your behalf? Have you seen him as the one who loves sinners and welcomes them? Have you seen him and worshiped him as the angels do in heaven around the throne? Have you seen him as your consoler when you've been heartbroken with grief? Some of you in this moment have no idea what I'm talking about. You're looking around to see 
My friend, cry out to God today to remove the veil from your eyes that you may see Christ and by seeing, live. The first promise is that the believer will see Christ. Look at the second promise also in verse 19. Jesus promises that the believer will have unending life. Because I live, you will live also. This life can take at least two forms. First of all, spiritual life. Knowing that Jesus regenerates men in their deadness and makes them alive. That's what Ephesians 2, 1 says. Every person who's a believer knows this. When Paul says in Ephesians 2, 1, you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. John speaks about regeneration or making alive in the same way in 1 John 3 when he says, we know that we've passed out of death into life. In John chapter 3 in the gospel, John tells Nicodemus that he needs to be born from above, born again, experience the new birth because he's dead in trespasses and sins. This change, this this new life that is given is so radical that Paul can say in 2 Corinthians 5, old things have passed away, all things have become new. The believer, because of this new life that's unending, has new values, new goals, new priorities, new relationships. And this new life is unending. Doesn't Jesus say already in John 10, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. But it's also bodily life. Our bodies, one of the things that I do every single funeral and graveside service I do, I remind the people there that this body that we are seeing placed in the ground, this body will be raised up to live. It will be raised up glorified. It will be raised up to live for all eternity on the day of resurrection. But notice what Jesus says that is contingent upon. Look at verse 19. Jesus said, because I live, you will live also. And this is glorious because as Peter said on the day of Pentecost, speaking of the resurrection of Jesus, it was not possible for death to hold him. In him is life. When Christ arose from that grave on Sunday morning, he became the first fruits. That's what Paul calls him in 1 Corinthians 15. And our fortunes rise or fall together. We are tied to Christ. If Christ, our head, is alive, then there is no danger that the body shall perish. This is the glorious doctrine of union with Christ. We're united to him in his death, and so we're dead to sin. We're united to him in his resurrection, and so we'll be raised. We're united to him as the reigning king, and so one day we'll rule with him. The sole reason you may have hope of eternal life is all tied to Christ. No Christ, no eternal life. Because he lives, we will live also. This is what Jesus means when he said in John 6, he who feeds on me will live because of me. There's a third promise. We saw this last week some. Look at verse 20 and 23 in our text. A third promise Jesus makes that the believer will be indwelt by God. Notice what Jesus says in verse 20. He says, or in verse 23, we will come to him and make our home with him. Look back in John 14, the first few verses in verse 2 and 3. Jesus uses the same word in verse 2 and 3 when he says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it weren't so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. He's using the same word there that he uses in verse 23 when he speaks of making our home. And he comforts the disciples by telling them that they will, that's a promise, Look at the will word in verse 23. Will be brought to live with him and make their abode with him. But now in verse 23, Jesus comforts them by saying, and we'll come to you first and make our abode with you. These two are linked. Listen to me very carefully. No one will have an abode in heaven prepared by Jesus who doesn't first have God abiding with them on earth. Did you hear that? No one will have an eternal abode in heaven who doesn't first have, verse 23, God abiding with them. 
Now, one of the exciting things about this word used in John 14, verse 2 and John 14, 23, is they both speak of permanence. At conversion, the Father and the Son send the Holy Spirit to take up residence in the believer. This is what we spoke of last week is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Absence of the indwelling is a proof of an unsaved condition. The believer knows that if he has the indwelling Holy Spirit, the very third person of the Godhead taking up residence in him, he knows that he cannot take sin lightly. He cannot go to that place. He cannot engage in that activity. He cannot have that discussion because he's carrying within his own flesh the third person of the Godhead. He is dragging the blessed Holy Spirit towards sin. The fourth promise that Jesus makes. Look at verses 21 through 23. Jesus promises that the obedient believer will be loved by father and son. Look carefully what Jesus says. And I want you to notice the emphasis on obedience. Look at verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them. It is he who loves me. In verse 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him. Now, all this is doing is we're going to see next week, we're going to see a little bit more about Jesus' pedagogical model. And I'll I'll refer to this in a moment when we apply this word. But this is a drumbeat that Jesus keeps sounding. The one who obeys his commands will be loved by the Father. You understand this. The people who love my wife and treat her well, I'm going to have a deep affection for them. The Father will love the one who loves Christ and keeps his word. But this text is a great example of a deep and abiding biblical principle. God promises everywhere in the Old and New Testament to bless obedience and to curse disobedience over and over again. For example, in Isaiah 58, God gives the Sabbath principle and then he promises a blessing for obeying the command. In Malachi chapter 3, God commands the tithe and then he promises a blessing for obedience. You think, well, that's all Old Testament stuff. No, it's not. In Ephesians 6, God repeats the fifth commandment, telling children to obey their parents, and then he promises blessing upon them for obedience. So who is the one loved by the Father and the Son? Look at verse 21. The one who has the commandments of Christ, he knows them, agrees with them, has no other opinion than them, and keeps, keeps the commandments of Christ. He's not just a hearer and a student of the commands of Christ, but he's a doer of the word. How do we apply this word? Let me make three types of applications to us. The first is a pedagogical application. This text presents you with our Lord's pedagogical method, his teaching method. And I want you to hear what it is, and you're not going to like it. Repetition. See, we live in the age of novelty. Oh, Carl, I heard that once. You preached on that in 2009. I don't want to hear that again. What we will see is that this theme has already been told us in verse 15, and this theme will keep occurring through the upper room discourse. Jesus repeats over and over again. In fact, one New Testament scholar has said, when you take the Gospels and you take all that Jesus says, There are approximately 38 themes that Jesus teaches on, each of which are repeated dozens of times. That's our Lord's pedagogical method. Repetition, whether in story or catechism. By the way, this is why we have our children here on Wednesday night for catechists to learn the catechism. Because by repetition, by question and answer, we want them to learn true doctrine, accurate theology, to fulfill our vows we took at baptism to teach them all the doctrines of our holy religion. We know that the best way to do that is to grab them when they're young and to imprint that upon their mind. Repetition, whether it be in story or catechism or whatever, 
has the approval of the Savior because that's what he did. Look back at verse 15. Same truth. Now Jesus says it again in verse 21. Then he says it again in verse 23. And so what we learn is this is our Lord's teaching methodology, telling us the truth and then repeating it over and over again. A second application you should see. It's theological. This text presents you with an inescapable emphasis on the Trinity. Look at verse 23. Jesus there says, we will come to him. Jesus taught a plurality and equality of the persons. What can be said of the Father can be said of the Son. Jesus is teaching again Trinitarianism. He could have stressed many things on that last night before the cross. He has a a window of about 150 minutes to teach the disciples. And what does he stress over and over again? He drives home the doctrine of the Trinity. For those of you who think, oh, it's so abstract, and who can understand it? And we really don't need to talk about that. The Lord Jesus, before he goes to the cross, one of the last doctrines he wanted to hammer home with his disciples was Trinitarianism. The glorious doctrine of one God eternally existing in three co-equal persons. Don't think that this doctrine is abstract or irrelevant. Jesus, in the midst of very practical discussions, repeats this understanding. Look at verse 23. We will come to him. A third application. This text repeats. We already saw it in verse 15, but now we see it in verse 21, don't we? And verse 23 shows our Lord Jesus Christ deep passion that those who claim his name be an obedient people. Have you understood this? Are you seeking today out of love for Christ to conscientiously, immediately, cheerfully, and completely obey the commands of Christ? Let's pray. Our Father, how we thank you that you are a promise-making and a promise-keeping God. We thank you for these glorious promises that our Lord Jesus has given us even on the night before he goes to the cross for us. Lord, we ask that you give us strength to live by these promises, that we would cling to them all the more tightly, that we would especially cling to these promises that to love you And to know your blessing is to obey the commands of Jesus. And so, Lord, we would hear the words of Jesus ringing in our ears, being repeated over and over again. Oh, Lord, help us to walk by these promises. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your Trinity Psalter hymnal and turn to hymn number 417 as we stand and sing, Jesus Shall Reign. This is a setting of Psalm 72. Hymn 417.
The Lord's Day has only begun. We hope you'll join us now for a time of refreshments in the Fellowship Hall and then make your way to one of our excellent Sunday School classes. I'll be teaching the intro class right there in that glassed-in room. And uh, then we would certainly invite you tonight to come back and close out the Lord's Day in worship once again as we continue our study of the life of Samuel. Now receive the Lord's b blessing and benediction. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that is in at work in us, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus, to all generations forever and ever. Amen.